Hello, and welcome back to the ARC Specialties Roboticist Chronicles podcast. This is another in our series on Dan's Business Secrets. We're out here in the shop. This is my world. This is where we put the machines together and make them work. But if you get into business, what you'll learn is there's a lot of other arenas you have to deal with. One of these is law. We have a corporate attorney named Aaron Lloyd. Aaron's been helping us for many, many years. And so I've asked him to come on the podcast today and share with you some of the things that he's taught us. I think you're going to enjoy this one. Hello, this is Dan Alford, and you're listening to the ARC Specialties Roboticist Chronicles podcast. We're doing a series on Dan's business secrets. I'm going to give you a little spoiler. Most of my success is attributable to the people that surround me, and I'm a scary good judge of talent. So what we're going to do is bring on people that have helped me through all my trials and tribulations of running a business. And today we have a very special guest, Aaron Lloyd. Aaron, thanks for coming on the show. Glad to be here. And what do you do for a living? You're the subject matter expert on yourself, so tell us something. Um, so I am an attorney here in Houston, Texas, that mostly specializes in um, taxation and transactions. And how long have we worked together? What's the backstory here? Um, I believe that you and I met in 2013. Um, so you were a longtime client of my previous firm. And um, you were set to have a meeting with my supervising attorney who had a situation come up and he asked if I could cover a meeting. And I said, sure. And we discussed some matters. And as you were leaving that day, um, you, uh, you asked me just as we were exchanging pleasantries and you said, uh, you said, so what are you doing this weekend? And I said, oh, I'm just riding my bike. Now, what I meant was that I had recently gotten a bike uh, as a birthday present, actually, because I needed to do something with my time. I was, in, I was in my 30s, and I hadn't been on a bike since I was in college. And my plan was to make a, like a ramp and a jump in, at the base of my driveway to do with my little kids at the time. And that, so that's what I meant by riding my I bike. I misunderstood. You thought I meant something like actual more serious cycling. And you said, oh, do you ride? And I thought you were asking more colloquially, like, do I know how to ride? And so I said, yes. And you asked me if I was any good. And I said, I'm all right. And you said, what does that mean? And I said, well, I don't know. I said, but I'm probably better than you. <laughs> and um, so you laughed and you were like, you should be on my MS-150 team. And I said, sounds like a plan. Send me the details. We shook hands and you walked away. And about a, later that day, I started to wonder what the MS-150 was. And tell our audience. Uh, the MS-150 is a bicycle ride of, at least depending on the route you take, of approximately 150 miles. At the time, it went from Houston to Austin to raise money for uh, MS and MS research. And so uh, I started, um, even a while after that, training fairly earnestly on the only bike I owned, which was a mountain bike. Inappropriate inappropriate. I struggled mightily to ride three miles my first time out um, and the hopes that I would be able to ride the MS-150 on that mountain bike. And indeed you did. I did. And then uh, we repeated it several times and we rode again yes. this year in April. That's, that's correct. This was our first time since they changed the route to do it where we rode from Houston to LaGrange and then to College Station. And you did it on a tandem with your daughter? I did at, at your uh, at your wonderful suggestion. I did it. What I did this year's ride on a tandem with my daughter. She just turned 16 recently. She's 15 at the time. And you told me at the time when I was riding, you said, "Do this with your kids when they're teenagers, because training for it and doing it will be a fantastic bonding experience." And I said, "You know what? That's probably true." And so we we were going to do it in 2020, and then the MS150 got canceled or delay slash canceled because of COVID. And so we were only able to do it this year. And as good of an experience as you said it would be, it was actually much better. And I counted among my favorite things I've ever done, training for the ride with my daughter and doing the ride. So, so all of you out there with a, a teenage daughter, this is one of the few things that you can do that your daughter will work with you and train with you on. And if you have a tandem bike, it's a wonderful experience because you spent two days chatting. Absolutely. Well, in the, in the training actually before that, um, you know, you don't know. I mean, you know that riding a tandem is actually pretty hard. Yes. And when people ride up next to you, they're like, oh, is that easier? Because you have two people because you still have, 
you know, two wheels. So you're splitting the weight of the wheels. Is that easier? And as I would tell people, I'd say, no, I, I, I personally, I find it quite a bit harder because among other things, we were constantly fighting each other to balance. And I was never able to ride standing up on the tandem with her on the back because I didn't realize how much I throw the bike to get like power. Like mm -hmm. you throw it the opposite direction if you're trying to make it up a hill. And I do that a lot when I ride. I also ride with no hands a lot and because it hurts, it hurts to be grab, grabbing the handlebars. And so I actually found riding the tandem to be much more difficult than even my first ride on the mountain bike. What you're alluding to is you have precious cargo and you have to take it much more seriously. And that's, that's absolutely the case also. But so in that way, the precious cargo, that was largely ameliorated by having such a great cheerleader behind me. We, when we did the tour to Houston, uh, in preparation for the MS-150. At one point we were coming back, it was hot as anything. We were riding down Allen Parkway, which as you know, has the big dips. And you go, and that's the thing about dips. They're a lot of fun to go down, but they're tough going up. And uh, at one point we were going and she said, dad, we gotta go really fast on this down if we're gonna make it back up. This is right at the end. It was like mile 60 or 61 or something. And I said, I'm doing the best I can. I called my daughter B said, I'm doing the best I can. And she started patting me on the back as we were going. She was like, you got this, Dad. You got it. And at that point, I was at least my version of uh, maybe not Superman, but I, I was Hulk-like. It, it, it was Hulk-like. I'm glad you all enjoyed it. I certainly did all the years I rode with my daughter. So Yeah, no, I wouldn't I wouldn't trade the, the memories or the experience for anything. And next year, I plan to ride with both of my kids, although we will all be on uh, separate bikes. That's probably best. I would agree with that. Among other things, Brianna, my daughter, she thinks that I was slowing her down. We'll see next year. We shall see. And you say you have another one. What was our re We've had a couple experiences with okay, young, so young Eli did. also. All right, so um, we also, as far as our experiences, um, you have made my life much more intense and way more interesting. Um, happen we happen to meet at These a very legal interesting cases. time. These aren't legal cases. Not legal cases. Uh, as far as legal wise, you largely stay out of trouble. I try. Um, so uh, no, so um, like when I met you, I, I it happened to be at that precarious time where I'd become established enough in my career and new enough to where I did start to have time for like outside hobbies and interests. The problem was up up until that point, and there was a couple other things I was doing at the time. I had allowed all my hobbies and interests to wither on the vine. And so um, I, I still owned all the stuff for my hobbies and interests, but I didn't do any of them anymore. And so when I met you, you're like, okay, ride the MS-150. I was like, okay, well, I can do that. You know, I, I guess I like riding a bike. Okay, that works. And then we've also done some shooting stuff very poorly on my part. Um, and so your son got his first deer with us. Yes, yep. Eli shot his first deer at your ranch, which, mm -hmm. you, which I got the trophy from you on this last weekend. And then um, also we have, uh, you know, you have helped me and my son build a still in progress, but very, very close to being finished at this point, uh, go-kart. Everybody needs a go-kart. Well, yeah, and uh, do that and then help my daughter build a cart for the equipment for her band at oh, our yeah. school. I'm all about teaching kids how to weld and build things. You know, that's uh, creation is fun. So my daughter's a good kid and she does good stuff and she goes to not a large school, but a small enough school. But I would say that in spite of everything else she's done, I think the thing she's most known for at that school is for being the kid who built the cart for the drum line. Sometimes it's that easy. Oh yeah. That's, that's, that's an interesting way to think about it, but yeah. So ha had all that stuff and you know, we hung out and kind of done stuff since then. I try my best to keep up with you, you know, and um, yeah, no, and, and it's, so of the things I touched on, up until that point in my life, I rarely ever did things that I wasn't good at. And so for example, you know, for instance, that I'm not a very strong bike rider. You know that I'm actually not very good, at least in the circles you're traveling in, as far as shooting and doing stuff like that. And whereas when I was younger, I wouldn't have kept doing it. At this age, like I'm, I've, I guess I've reached the maturity level to where I, uh, I'm comfortable and enjoy doing things even when I'm not good at them. That's life. <laughs> but I'm better at life than you. So like you're, you're used to that. <laughs> but my life was getting narrower and narrower because I was only doing the stuff I was really good at. Luckily, I excel in so many things that it still kept a pretty wide variety of things. But now I'm expanding to even those things at which I am not particularly great at. Also, 
Um, you know, I've stopped. It's the equivalent of I, I also, you know, I've never liked playing basketball against the four year olds because, yeah, you think you think you're good, but you're playing against four year olds. So stepping it up and going to the next thing, I'll run into someone who thinks I'm in good shape. And then, then I'm like, oh, well, you should see the people I actually spend time or if you think, you know, I pity you if you think this or like or go shooting like, oh, so, oh, you're a pretty good shot. And I'm like, I'll pass a thousand yards. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no. So, yeah. So that's that that has been an interesting ride. All right. People are listening for law. So, you know, yep. we got we got yep. a lot of history. Yep. And, yep. and that's the fun thing about doing business with people you like is you end up, you know, developing a rapport, doing some other things on the outside with. But back to law. OK. okay. Mm -hmm. uh, would you recommend it as a profession? So um, I actually get asked this question a lot. Um, I think it's the 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 remnants and the remainders of um, the LA law generation having their kids and their grandkids and raising it. And so there's a lot of prestige still associated with it. And I tend to associate with successful people. And um, so people are like, oh, should my kid be a lawyer? My kid's thinking about going to law school. Um, I would say that I generally recommend against people going into the law. Um, and But I would recommend it to very few as a profession but I do recommend it to some as a trade based on the suitability of your personality for it. Suits you. Uh, it does. And, but I also believe that I approach it more as a trade than as a profession. Like there are aspects of it that are a profession. Um, but you know, as far as a lot of lawyers, you know, especially what I do, you're acting more, more as a, of a fixer than as, you know, an academic or someone, separate apart from it i rarely run into the same legal problem over and over again now, if i were in-house counsel for a company or something or if i had a very very specialized transaction where i was constantly doing the same thing then i think it would draw more upon my knowledge whereas now it's okay every problem is different everything is new and how do i use the tools that i have my tools aren't physical tools usually uh, my tools aren't physical tools but those tools that I, I use tools to solve problems. Um, and so I consider it actually more of a trade. It, it bills more like a trade, among other things. You know, most lawyers charge by the hour, just like plumbers. Um, we both deal with a lot of stuff. And um, so I do recommend it as a, as a trade if you have a suitable personality type for it. The personality type that I see, you know, many of the people I went to law school with are no longer practicing law. And that's not a bad thing. You know, they found something better. They found something different. They found something that suited their personality. And um, so I think if you have the type of personality, if you really like solving problems, um, the law is a good profession for you. If you have a savior complex, like I do, the law can be a good profession or trade or profession for you. Um, if you like working with people, at least in the type of law I practice, it can be a good profession for you if you think that you'll be sitting around pontificating about some incredibly creative solution that involves a case from 1940 i'm sure there are lawyers that do that for a living but i don't know those lawyers and the lawyers that i do know who are successful at least based on either what i would consider to be success which isn't always money or which is rarely money actually um, or their own definition of success i have found that most of them aren't doing that every day and don't desire to do that every day either. So if you have the personality, I think it could be a great trade. Well, I, I, I watch your work and I enjoy it. Uh, you know, you've got the, the formal training, but you seem to think two moves ahead of the other guys. So what trait allows you to do that? And is that necessary? It certainly works to my benefit. Um, I would say that for that, um, so people are rarely planning for the next question. So there's this, there's this radio promotion that they had here in Houston. They had it for years. It was called Dead Guy in the Envelope. And it was a name of a person in an envelope. And callers could call in and they could ask one question and then they could make their guess. And it drove me nuts to listen to it. I don't like morning shows anyway. But people would ask a question. And so here's an example of how it typically played out. So and say, is the person an inventor? And they'd say no. And then the person would say, oh, I was going to guess Albert Einstein. And then they pick up the next caller. And that's how it went for the entirety of the show, where the question they were asking did provide information, but it didn't inform their next step. And so if you said, okay, people didn't have the plan, like, okay, I think it's Einstein, 
So they had their answer first, and then they came up with their question, which didn't change what they were going to ask anyway. So, and it drove me nuts to listen to because people are rarely thinking about what happens. So for example, people, I found a big error on my tax return. And so they come to me and they're like, oh, maybe they did it on accident. Maybe it was their tax return preparer that did it. I say, I think there's a big error on my tax return. And before I even ask what the error is, I'll say, okay, if there is an error, what do you plan to do? And they always have an answer to that on some form. Usually it's, well, whatever you tell me to do. Um, and I say, if there's not an error, what do you plan to do? Because although they know that's a possibility, logically, they're not thinking about that next step. And so that, when you ask why, why I seem to be ahead, because a lot of people, usually you're prepared for the thing you're worried about happening. And so the, I believe that, the, okay, if that, then what? And if not, then what? And actually, I found it to be very calming to people. You know, I, I have a lot of people sit across the table from me and, you know, very upset, you know, anxiety, tears a lot of times. You know, I've had many times people come in and say, listen, I found this mistake. I can't pay these taxes and I'll go to jail if I have to. Or people ask me, am I going to jail? I get that a lot. And um, I have a kind of a spiel I give when that happens. Um, because as I learned from uh, driving cars on the track, another thing that you got me into, um, people don't make good decisions when their heart rate starts to rise. And so I need people making their best decisions. And so my first job is to calm someone down so that they're acting and thinking rationally. I'll often be sitting across the table from someone, especially if they're really scared, they're wearing clothes that are unfamiliar and uncomfortable with them. They felt like they needed to be more formal. They need to get maybe a little bit more dressed up than they do. Um, and their heart rate is raised. And to be honest, they're not in a position, they're not the best them to be making tough decisions. So all the racetrack training has actually beneficial. Absolutely. Interesting. Absolutely. So the cycling has been good in the way we do it, because as you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very slow, especially uphill when I cycle, but I go all day. Like, I don't have that. Like, I see much better riders, much better, waiting for the sag wagon, which I'm required to say there is no shame in, obviously, even though it's totally shame. The sag wagon's what you ride in if yes. you're tired of riding. And yeah, that's, pick you that's up for and... people who cannot ride further. And, um, and I, myself, have ridden the sag. Um, uh, and so uh, the much better, much better, people who are in much better shape, and certainly people who have way better equipment than me, um, you know, as you said, when we had a guy that was joining the team, the police officer that time, and he said, so what's my goal? And we were sitting around. I think we had all had a couple beers. And I said, well, you have to decide that. I said, I believe that a, rider, that a new rider's goal for the first time should to not be the person waiting for the sag wagon with the most expensive gear. Ah, so you have an excuse. Yeah. Well, no, 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 no. It's just you, you said, yeah, you don't want to be the person tapping out at mile 15 with the full arrow helmet. No, no. Right. And that's not because it's more embarrassing to do that, although it, should it be. is. Um, it's because, OK, I, I didn't I didn't do the other. So, um, yeah, so that, that that's what I would think is people not thinking about. So, yeah, the, driving cars, driving cars, gambling and um and uh, and and uh, uh, and doing endurance sports have all taught me a lot, and helped me a lot professionally. I believe. In addition to making me a more interesting person. Okay, this is all happiness in life. You're making yep. law sound good, but uh -huh. your your mentor, my friend, once yep. told me a story. He says when you have a small problem, you deal with it. If it's a little bit worse, you tell your wife. If it's worse than that, you tell your priest. But if it's terrible, if it's daunting, if it's if it's something you can't handle, you go talk to your lawyer lawyer and yeah. so he's that his point was you only get the bad stuff that's true and so and that's the next thing i i would have i was always going to say about being a lawyer is if you are not comfortable on people dumping their problems onto you all the time this is not the profession to you yes i have represented people who won the lottery um i you know represent people when other good things happen but usually you know as don knight who uh, was my mentor uh, taught me, he said, you know, saints just don't have a lot of use for lawyers. And that doesn't mean that if you need a lawyer, you're bad, um, but people come and dump their problems on you. And so how can you facilitate and fix their problems? And so that part of the law, you know, I tell people, it's like, you know, the, if you're willing, if you have the intelligence and the ambition and the work ethic to be a successful lawyer, because lawyers is just a type of service provider. 
If you have that, and if your main motivation is money, then you can apply those skills in other ways in which you will make more money. Um, I didn't really have the guidance knowing that. I thought in order, as a kid, I looked at you know the other kids at school whose parents seemed to be you know, doing better than my family, and it seemed that their parents were either uh, doctors, lawyers, or like stockbrokers. And so I thought if you wanted to be successful, you needed to be a doctor, or a lawyer, a stockbroker, an accountant, or something like that. And so um, I didn't really, you know, have the guidance or the career focus for that. Or, and luckily, though, it turned out that my personality is well suited to it. But as far as being a lawyer, when things go bad, that's who people look to. So you can find yourself, you know, I remember the first time I was like 26, 27 years old and a group of uh, much older people. It was a meeting. We were discussing very serious matters that were going to affect the financial future of some of the people at that table and the livelihood of large numbers of people and everyone kind of is talking and then then the person sitting at the head of the table says well aaron what do you think and they all turn and look at me and it's your call uh not not really my call as much as it was i mean i'm still thrilled i get to call adults by their first name and so if you're not that person if you don't feel comfortable having problems dumped on you and people asking okay what do we do now um, then this isn't the profession for you. Um, and yes, just, just trying to be clear to all, of, all the young people out there listening to you. It's, yeah. it's not all happiness and light. In fact, it's not at all. That no, it, it's not. It's it's difficult. It's stressful. It's very timeline intensive. Um, but if you like to help people, I mean, on the extreme level, I had one time in a meeting a woman who um, was just taking her problem from my perspective way too seriously literally get on the ground on her knees and start kissing my hand in gratitude it was very uncomfortable much more much more so uncomfortable for her son who was sitting there also um but so that type of thing yeah i mean if if you're not comfortable with the high stakes if you know i used to say when i spoke at the law school i'd say you know in my old building i said you know the air conditioning system switches over during daylight savings time at uh, three fifteen in the morning, and it makes a really strange sound. I know that and because know I've that. been there, and I know when that sound happens enough to know, oh, it's three fifteen. And so, um, if if you're not if you're not interested or you're not or, you're, or it's not your personality to work very hard, this is not a very good profession for you because there's no economies of scale, and I can only do what I do. So, you know, what you manufacture stuff, another manufacturing line that can produce more financial, uh, you know, more financial benefits. I have not been able to duplicate myself yet, although I have burned through many associates trying. Um, and so it, since it doesn't scale the same way, there's only a certain number of hours a day. If you're not really wanting to work very hard or not, excuse me, if you're not willing to work incredibly hard, then I don't think that it's the right profession for you. With that said, you don't have to be one-dimensional. It's something that I struggle with. I see. Now, you, you claim you're a tax lawyer, but yet yes. you've helped me with numerous problems. I mean, we won't go into detail, but uh, right. all, all, all sorts of things. Like you're, you're the guy that structures our companies. You're the yeah. one that determines if it should be an S-Corp, a DBA, or an LLC. Uh, go into that a little bit, which, talk. you know, we're in Texas, right? So, sure. so and yet you've, you've set up structures for me all these different ways what, what's the thought process so what are the two certainties in life death and taxes that's right and so taxes I, I personally believe as a tax person that tax shouldn't drive your decisions but it, it it's reckless not to have them factor in or consider the consequences so Although, you know, I primarily do tax, although I'm not certified by the Texas Board of Legal Specialization. Um, good disclaimer. Yeah, good. Thank you. I'm in the disclaimer business. Um, also in cross indemnities. Um, but so tax touches upon everything. So, for example, at, at its most basic level, you know, it's not difficult to set up a company. Anyone can do it. Um, you know, uh, I did my own DBA way back in the beginning. Yeah. And so that, that's not difficult to do. However, is the DBA the right way to go? And those types of things inform a tax is a huge driver of that, among other considerations. So although I, I, I primarily do tax, I actually describe myself when I'm being honest about what it is that I do. 
Um, I describe myself as a transactional lawyer. So I do transactions. And setting up a company is a type of transaction. Um, it's just a transaction between you and something that doesn't exist yet. And so if you think about it that way, although it's tax, and tax certainly informs it, um, it's more that where I would say I'm different than a lot of transactional lawyers is because I do know a lot about tax. As you know, my undergraduate degree is in accounting. Um, most lawyers can't add and subtract. And most accountants um, are more focused on compliance than on coming up with creative solutions. And so although I am like many other transactional lawyers, um, many of them, in fact, almost all lawyers have a footer on their email that says, I'm not giving tax advice, it's not intended, don't rely on it, according to sec Circular 230. Now, I have that on my email as well, um, but in that way, I am the fairly unusual bird that, of a lawyer that actually knows a fair amount about tax and understands a fair amount about it. So. What all the, pa let's see, we pay property tax, income tax, franchise tax, sales tax. Which one in Texas causes the most grief and trouble? Um, so I would say in Texas, it would be sales tax. That's what um, I've always heard. The Texas sales tax is, um, is rarely taken seriously until it's too late. Um, I've referred to in the past Texas sales taxes like pancreatic cancer. A um, little bit better mortality rate with Texas sales tax. Um, but so Texas sales tax is incredibly complex. As you know, Texas doesn't, at least officially, it doesn't have an income tax. And so it's financed by, you know, severance tax, oil and gas revenue, but by Texas sales and use tax. And um, Texas sales and use tax is incredibly complex. And everyone's afraid of the IRS and everyone takes their federal taxes very seriously, but people rarely take sales tax very seriously. And they don't find out. So your typical someone gets a notice of audit and then they show up, the auditor shows up and the person's like, okay, here's our records. Um, the current year is in those file cabinets. It goes from A to Z, left to right. Prior, the last two years are in those file cabinets. Those actually go from Z to A for reasons we're not clear about. Um, grab whatever you need out of there. Um, there's a fridge with Cokes in it off to the side. The bathroom's down the hall. Let me know if you need anything. And then people don't take the audit seriously. They don't really helpful to the auditor. And then they get a bill that is equal to, in some cases, their revenues for the past four years times eight and a quarter percent. Eight and a quarter percent and right here in Houston. And their expenses times eight and a quarter percent. Uh -huh. And I have yet to find the business that that is n that that would not be a fatal blow. And so the laws are very complex. Um, they're very technical and they're difficult to follow. Uh, it was, it was uh, one of the high points of my life when they decided that in Texas, manufacturing equipment used by a manufacturer would become tax exempt. And that is true, and that's done a lot to grow Texas business. However, the, um, that, so it's not, it's not just equipment, it's equipment that causes What's the phrase change. again? Change? It, it causes a change in the raw materials or in the end product. Fortunately, that's what I do for a living, so that greatly simplified my life. Absolutely, and for you it's very clear, but for, um, and this is something that I believe that the comptroller, Texas comptroller, who's in charge of administering our sales tax in Texas, I think has done a very um, poor job of making clear because you have businesses that under the common definition of manufacturing, only manufacture things, yet they can find themselves with very significant uh, sales and use tax liability. Um, because for instance, if it's a chemical company, let's say um, that material is temporarily stored before it's processed. And that vessel that it's stored in, although they don't think about it, well, yeah, we put it in there right before we mix it up or right before we blend it. Well, that's not taxable or it can be taxable. And those vessels, they're not giving those away. We're not talking about a 50-gallon drum with a hole drilled in the side of it. So, um, yes, that has been a great benefit to Texas. It would be ludicrous. That, that's more keeping up with the Joneses. Uh, I, all states, in an attempt to do that, if, well, if you're 
if you're manufacturing something, you should probably, if you're gonna charge tax on the things you manufacture, you probably shouldn't have to pay tax on the things you use to manufacture them. That's double so taxation. It is, um, but documenting that and meeting the various burdens of proof can be very difficult. So um, sales tax is probably the most statistically unusual thing I do, but I would say, and it's, you know, it's a focus, uh, because I do it, I see more problems with it. I would say that in Texas, that's people's biggest tax problem because almost everybody has a general idea of how the income tax works. Um, everyone understands how property taxes work. I have yet to meet a property owner that doesn't understand how they work. Um, but I'll run into people or represent people who have been doing what it is that they do for decades with no understanding or an incorrect understanding of the appropriate sales and use tax consequences of what they do. Best example here at Dark Specialties is some of our electricity is tax-free and some of it is taxed. That is Only correct. the electricity that's actually used to manufacture and change materials. And so that, that was the, uh, that required an extensive study just, just to get that in place. So yeah, that, I agree. That's uh, Sales tax is the tough one here in Texas. And electricity is, I'm sure, one of your biggest expenses. Oh, indeed, it is. It's and so if that all of a sudden becomes more expensive by eight and a quarter, I think that completely changes probably your business model. Oh, it would. So, so while we're on the subject of Texas, uh, we seem to be attracting a lot of businesses coming in from uh, other states. Right. On the on the uh, left coast and the west coast, as they say, and uh, so talk about the business environment from a tax attorney's perspective in Texas. You got any comments for anybody listening from out of state? I do. Um, Texas is a great place to do business. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's easy to set up companies like it is in all of the 50 states. Um, we do not formally have an income tax. We do have a franchise tax, which functions as an income tax for uh, incorporated entities. Um, but it has a very high threshold before you actually have to pay tax on it. Um, and what's the effective rate? Uh, so that that's actually that de that depends on a lot. So it's 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 a think of it as an income tax that only has very limited amounts of deduction. So for example, generally you take your gross receipts and you either just deduct the cost of goods sold or you deduct salaries. And then based on what you're deducting, whether or not you're a wholesaler, I mean, there's a lot of things. So it's nearly a flat tax. That. No, I wouldn't say that. Um, be, if it is, it would be even more dishonest than most proposals I see for a flat tax, uh, but we do have the franchise tax. It is material. Um, it, uh, it's, it's something that not a lot of resources are devoted to that I see on the private sector compliance side of things. Um, I haven't done a lot of franchise tax audits, to be honest, because there aren't a lot of them. Um, so we do have a franchise tax, but it's lower than um, you know other states, even surrounding states, which obviously gives a competitive advantage. Um, you know, you're still paying your same federal taxes. And Texas does generally take a pretty, so for instance, it, for a general business, we don't have general business licenses in right. Texas. And when I deal with people, particularly people outside of the country, they're like, oh, well, we need to send us a copy of your business license. And they say, and I'll get they're like, so I said, well, we don't have those. Now, if you're in a certain profession or maybe you're an engineer, right. you know, and I said, we don't have those. Cut hair. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's very important. Um, I say we don't have those. People are like, so anyone can do business in Texas? Yes. Anyone can do business in Texas. Um, so I, I, I believe that Texas also is very um, friendly in terms for as a business environment of um, we, we don't have a lot of complex or what I would consider to be incredibly onerous laws relating to how you do business. We do have a Deceptive Trade Practices Act that I think is similar to many other states as far as, you know, the things that we generally all agree that you can't do to rip off consumers. You know, we do have we do have protection for consumers. Um, but as far as other things, we just we just don't have what I run into when my clients go into other states. I think Texas is a great environment to do business and the law does a really good job of protecting the inter the organi the business organizational interests of entities in Texas. It, many times I run into people in other states who are like, okay, we, need, we want to do business in Texas. We'll set up a new Delaware company and do that. I say, well, why don't you just use Texas? And when I do very large transactions, um, you know, it's often they want the acquirer to be a Delaware company. And I say, well, why do you want Delaware? And that, well, because that, Delaware is the standard answer. Well, Delaware is a good state. 
They respect corporate governance. You know, you know, they don't do a lot of uppity shareholders or owners. And um, I say, well, I, I when I ask people, I'm like, well, why do you believe that Delaware is better than Texas? I usually get an answer that's the equivalent of that's just how we do it. So um, I think Texas is a great state for um, for businesses to come to and to operate in. Um, and, you know, like, for instance, when you run into people in other states, also Texas is relatively uh, corruption free. Indeed. Um, you know, when you have gone, you built a facility and um, and not only did I'm certain you not have to pay a bribe or make a con- campaign contribution to anyone for that. I doubt you had any contact with the politicians that represent that area. And I'll bet you don't even know who they are. Indeed, that is the case. I have, I have never even been asked for a bribe in the United States, but I work in 32 countries, so I can't say that I've never been asked for a bribe. So quick, just as, a, as an aside, years ago, I was waiting at the Harris County Appraisal District on a Saturday. I was being punished for my success, so they scheduled me for a Saturday. And while I was there, I was talking to this guy from New York who was coming down. He owned a number of apartment complexes in Houston. And he was bored, and um, and he, we got to talking, and he was like, hey, do you do this? And I said, yeah, I do some of this. And he was like, can you give me any pointers? And I was like, well, I mean, it depends. And I said, you know, be respectful. You know, he was a real nice guy. And, um, and I said, well, you know, just have an organization of what you're doing. And as we got to talking more, he said, you know, this is so crazy. And I said, what's that? He said, I'm about to go into a meeting and meet with someone who works for the appraisal district. He said, I assume they make 50 or 60 grand a year. He said, and I'm going to argue to them why I think my apartment complexes aren't worth as much as they say. He said, and then they have the ability to reduce the value, which reduces my taxes. He said, I fly down here and I do this myself because it's worth my time. And I said, okay. He said, if this were in New York, there would be buses waiting outside every day to take the people that work here to the casinos in Atlantic City. (laughs) He said, and everyone would expect them to be there. And he said, and no one would bat an eye. I said, well, that's the difference here. One, there are no buses out here. And in the property tax consulting firms, I said, they, would, they wouldn't even be caught dead suggesting something like that. I said, and if that did happen here, it would be front page news. <laughs> and he said, yeah. He said, I went to get a permit for something. He said, I didn't even have to like bribe an alderman or make a campaign contribution. He said, I wanted to add, add a, uh, he said, I talked to my construction guy and I said, hey, we need to add on and we're gonna build a new building for the apartment complex because I bought it as it stood. And he said, okay, who do I need to get an approval from? And they said, the, the code office, yeah. whatever it was. He said, well, how much is that gonna cost me? And they said, the filing fee was like $65. He said, I couldn't believe it. Welcome to Texas. Yeah, yeah, so I, I think that that makes Texas, You know, I'm not implying that the rest of the country is a, is a cesspool of corruption. Um, but Texas, we don't, like I say, you've been doing business for many, and you're in an emerging technology kind of frontier. And what you do is dangerous. Like the people working for you, they're not shuffling paper all day. No. You, know, you have gantry cranes out there. You have people with, you know, mel- metal melting two and a half feet fire, from their sparks, space. all this, yes. Yeah, all that stuff. And yet here you are not having to deal with a lot of that stuff. I don't think you would be able to operate as freely in other states as you do in Texas. Well. Fortunately, we don't believe in that. And I've, I've had to retrain a few foreign customers that uh, yeah. we don't play that way. Yeah. And I have had trouble at customs, but we just struggle through it. Yeah. And, and yeah, and so we, we just don't have that. I think that's a great benefit and allows a free movement of economics. Well, good for Texas. Uh, I was going to ask you about, uh, I, I know you do some mergers and acquisitions, mm-hmm. and you seem to enjoy it. I and do. Probably three times a week, I get calls from uh, companies which specialize in this, and I don't return them at all. But uh, I've always assumed that if you know if that if an opportunity like that presented itself presented itself to me, I would I would work through you. Can you talk to our audience? But that's because we have a good relationship. But talk to our audience about this whole M and A culture industry. There's a bunch of people out there doing it. What are the pros and cons? So um, it's certainly a culture and an industry very similar to what everybody's used to dealing with when you buy a house. Um, so you said like agents then? Yeah, they're, they're, they're essentially agents and they specialize in relationships. Um, you know, most lawyers and myself included actually 
don't play well with others when it comes to that. And it's not because I'm a particularly disagreeable person. I think I'm incredibly easy charming. to work with. Yeah, very easy to work with, especially when things go my way. Um, but you have different people serving as different roles. And so keep in mind, just like when you go to sell your house, um, the more unscrupulous realtors will come in, tell your house is worth a fortune. You got to list it with them. They'll have it sold within, you know, a week to you know, lock you into a contract. Yeah, and then as soon as they sign you up, they start telling you about why you need to take this offer and why you need to do this transaction. They went from talking you up to talking, talking. you down. Uh -huh. um, and it's just like, and it's, it's, it's a useful skill and the ability to do that, you know, for as much grief as lawyers get, you know, I told a guy at Best Buy one time how I marveled how quickly he went from telling me that I should buy this product because it's amazing to trying to sell me a warranty on this giant piece of garbage. I mean, the transition <laughs> was seamless. It was very impressive. But you noticed. I did, I did. And I said, well, if I need a warranty on it, I probably just shouldn't buy this. Probably crushed him. No, no, actually he was well prepared for it. And I complimented on it. I said, you know, I said, you're really good at this. And I said, you're really good. Um, but, but you didn't sell me. Um, so obviously it wasn't good enough. I'm sure the person is there that could have sold me, but it certainly wasn't him or his uh, supervisor that came in to help him. Um, so within that industry, you do have competing interests. And so the job of a person is first to sign you um, then to and get, get a fee in many cases. Yes. And then to work with you find a suitable match because they are matchmakers. Um, and then to shepherd you into the process and then pressure you heavily to close. Now, that's not always a bad thing. Some people get, you know, cold feet. Some people who need to sell need that type need of encouragement push. and push to do it um you know as you know um you know uh being stationary has its own momentum and sometimes it takes that to move people off center well back up to this matchmaking thing though mm -hmm. Did, is, is this like can we use go back to your real estate agent analogy do they want to do both sides of the deal so to speak doesn't that limit you no they <clears throat> i rarely see them on both sides of the deal although there are cozy relationships when people come to me and they say they're thinking about selling their company um and they're like well, do we need to hire a broker do we need to hire someone to do that um i always ask i say do you know who's going to buy you and often the answer is yes oh okay so that's and then so then mm -hmm. why why do you need the matchmaker as long as you have confidence in your other professionals because most of the times you're being bought either by a competitor, a customer, a vendor, or you're being bought as an equity play. And so if you know people in your area or your industry are all being bought by X, XYZ capital partners, um, you know they're going to be the ones that, you know, probably if you're looking to sell, they're probably going to be a candidate for you. Um, if, you know, you've been playing footsie and one of your vendors, all of a sudden you're really, really, really important to that vendor, you know, they may want to downward integrate you. And a lot of times they'll say, yeah, I think this company's going to buy me, or I think that person's okay. going to buy me. And if that's the case, then you don't need the role of the matchmaker. So one of the most valuable things that brokers often offer you don't need that service. So it's like, oh, I want to go to this great restaurant because I've heard they have a great shrimp appetizer, but I'm allergic to shellfish. It's like, maybe there's a different restaurant that would be better for you because the thing that they're really good at, you don't need. So if I don't have a deal set up, mm -hmm. uh, I need match.com. But if I have the deal set up, all we need is a priest and that's you. Um, yeah, sometimes. So, and then that's when the roles really shift and which is why a lot of lawyers don't get along well with brokers. And, um, in the non profane version of it years ago, I was involved in a transaction and I was arg and I got into it with the broker and, um, he told me that he was going to call the client and tell the client the reason his deal wasn't happening was because of me. And, um, and I said, well, feel free to do that. And he just couldn't help himself. You know, it's always you say one more thing, you take it one step too far. And he said, you know, Aaron, because I get paid for results and you get paid just to shuffle paper and you, you don't care if the deal closes or not. And I say, well, that's the difference. I said, you get paid for a closing and I get paid to protect the client. And so it's in your interest to close this deal, whether or not it's in the client's interest or not. 
And yes, it is in my interest to burn this deal to the ground if it's in the client's best interest. And I said, so I would say that I'm actually more aligned with what they want than you are. And then we exchanged some pleasantries and some observations about each other's physical appearance and slammed down the phone. So, but that, that is the different roles. And if there's not a tension there, then I think someone's not probably doing their job right. Um, and certainly not the lawyer. So there are many lawyers that do transactions that all their business is referrals from brokers. And um, I would, I, that's certainly fine. And if you're good at what you do, other brokers will be like, oh, I've worked with this guy before. He's good. He knows what he's doing. Um, but if, if, that's, if that's a common thing, you'd have to see whether or not what you're doing is in, whether or not you're filling the right role and whether or not the broker is filling the right role. I'll just bring this up because I can't be the only entrepreneur that's getting multiple calls a week. No. Uh, so there's a whole industry set up out there. Absolutely. Well, and it's because I believe, and I'm sure, you know, to the extent people watch this, I believe that it's easier to sell something than it is to create something. Not for so, me. Well. That, that, that's just not my style. I'm, I, I build them. Yeah, so I don't see a lot of, I don't see a lot of companies chasing brokers. I see a lot of brokers chasing okay. companies. Um, and so, you know, I mean, there, there's, I mean, there's that, but, but the money in being a broker can be fantastic. I don't think that I've ever been involved in a deal where I did anywhere near as far as the money side as the brokers involved. I mean, like, and usually it's a multiple of, Many, 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 many times. Now that may just mean that the brokers are smarter than me. That could be. Um, so uh, yeah. So I mean, that's there's that. So you get those calls, um, but you know, I look at that as all solicitations. You know, um, what what is it you're trying to sell me, and are your interests the same as mine? Um, and if you're if you're in a selling frame of mind, like listen, if I'm hungry. And walking around, it's awesome if someone shows up with some Girl Scout cookies asking for a donation. Oh yeah, they're just looking for the right time and opportunity. Yeah, but a lot of times it's more it's more similar to the real estate thing that we discussed, at least in my experience. All right, well that that's <clears throat> that doesn't apply to everybody everybody, but one thing that does that we've discussed before are wills. Yes. Do you have some advice for our audience out there? My dad died without a will, and I can tell you it was quite a problem. So, yeah, so this is actually something I feel very strongly about personally and professionally. Um, in addition to my other background, I used to, when I was in law school, I clerked for one of the probate courts here in Harris County. And I believe that everybody should have a will, bar none. And it's um, easy. It, I, I, in Texas, I believe that it is easy. In most states, I believe that it is easy. And I will go a step further to say that if you have children and you do not have a will, that is incredibly irresponsible. Um, you know, the probate process in many states is very difficult. Texas, I, I, I don't consider to be one of them. Um, but yeah, I mean, I get it. People don't want to think about it. No one wants to think about that day. Um, I was in a meeting earlier this week with an accountant and a client. And the accountant, at one point, we were talking about estate planning. And, you know, just having, I was trying to have a very honest discussion about the plans being made. And I happened to remark to the client who was older. And I said, listen, you're not going to be alive in 30 years. Was that harsh? No, I, I didn't think so, but um, but the accountant did. Um, I don't think I'll be alive so, in 30 years. That yeah, well, It doesn't yeah. offend me in the least. So as far as having a will, I mean, it is truly. So your estate plan for most people is the largest transaction that you will ever be involved in, even tangentially, except you're not around to explain what it was you were trying to do or make, dis or make the decisions and participate. And so you have this huge transaction. And some people just don't want to think about it. Some people, it's because it's unpleasant. Some people, they don't want to invest the time in it. Um, but it is so helpful. Like, as the person who has those meetings with people, I mean, um, you know, the you know the wife or the husband who's sitting there say, okay, you know, especially in an unexpected death, what's the next process? Oh, well, the court's going to appoint another attorney to see if the person had any illegitimate kids. Because the same rules that applied to Howard Hughes, the same laws and rules that applied to Howard Hughes' estate applies to yours, Joe Schmo. And our law in the United States for wills and estates, um, you know, comes to us, the lineage of it comes from, you know, the English system. 
And it's some of our oldest law because, you know, the lords and the landed gentry, that was very important over there. And those rules are written in blood. Those rules are written in wars. Those rules are written in families torn asunder. I mean, we have a set of default rules for that. And they're not bad. I mean, if there were easy, if there were better, easier answers, we'd have those instead. Because this is something that's been fought about. I mean, even go back to the Shakespearean plays. You know, man generally has about you know probably fifteen, maybe twenty, really core problems that just keep coming up over and over. And a big one is what happens when somebody dies. And if you don't plan for that, if you don't make that easier for the people who are left behind, I think you have done a great disservice to people that you didn't take the time and you didn't consider it important. Um, with that said, when I worked in the probate court, I was astounded at how many um, estates came through for lawyers that didn't have wills. Well, it happened to us. Fortunately, there wasn't much money, but what happened in my family was they froze my mother's accounts. Yeah. There was no argument between her and us kids, right. and yet they froze the accounts. So if nothing else, if, if you don't want uh, your accounts frozen, right. you, you need to do this. And then my other story, you know, everybody's got some more stories, is I had to testify as to the validity of a handwritten will because right. that was all that, uh, that somebody had. In this case, you know, my testimony in the will itself was sufficient, but thank goodness it was. And so in Texas, we do. That's called a holographic will in Texas. That's all in the testator's handwriting. And I've done many, um, I, I've been involved in many situations, particularly when I was at the court with holographic wills. A holographic will is 30 million times better than a complete lack of a will as far as things. And as an interesting aside, you talk about war stories. So, uh, Suicide notes often function as holographic wills. Feel right? I can't You're not recommending this, are you? I'm not recommending it. <laughs> okay. But um, but they don't have a will, and so we're trying to. Someone's in a position of trying to have to use a suicide note. How horrible! As a will, yeah. To try. So I've seen um, uh, one of them was on the back of an O'Reilly Auto Parts receipt, and the guy wrote, um, "I can't take it anymore. I'm so unhappy. Some really personal things that he probably didn't want being in the public record." Um, give everything to my kids. I want everything to go to my kids, except I want the Camaro that we restored together to go to my brother. And that was his will. And that ended up being probated as a will because it was handwritten. It was contemplating his demise. And so, yeah, I mean, even a, a holographic will is better than no will, but everybody should have a will. I feel right. strongly about that. Well, I do too, you know, after, after having been through it. And it, it's such an easy process, at least working with somebody like you. It was painless. Yeah. And so, well, I re so that, that, is that the lesson for today? Or do you have any other good points? I think we're running, running out of time here, Aaron. What, you know, you got, you know, the world's listening to you here. Uh, hello, hello, hello. Um, I would say as far as um, decision, as far as the, the advice that I'd give to people, is it's a lot easier to stay out of trouble than to get out of trouble. And so, you know, Dan, you and I were talking about in kind of preparation for this is um, there are certain things if you're, as long as you're in the environment and in the culture and in the society that you grew up in, you kind of have a feeling for what the, no, what the norms you are. You know the difference between right and wrong. Well, I'm not going to get into things where like, oh, well, you know, is it, you know, I mean, I, my anthropology class beat that out of me. Um, but as far as if you feel like you're doing something wrong or you feel like you're on the edge, you probably are. You know, um, I think that some aspects of the law are incredibly unfair. Um, you know, if you're driving down the road and you see a speed limit sign that says the speed limit is square root of 400 strictly enforced, I think that's unfair. Um, because some people may not be able to do that on the fly. It's a better they example. They can't do that in their head? Uh, well, uh, some that, people can't. What's that like? Some people can't. Um, there's a, a square root of 1,235. Um, so something like that, I, I think that's unfair. So sometimes the law is hard to comply with, even if you're trying, because you don't know. I, and I have a problem with laws like that, that some of the tax laws are a problem to our normal people can be in violation of something without knowing it, without having the, you know, the mindset to do it. Um, but if you feel like you're doing something wrong, you probably are. And in this day of, you know, I, now Dr. Google, I've been told is terrible. Apparently I'm dying of everything also, I asked. Um, but with the wealth of information out there, um, 
you should be able to figure out either where the lines are in what you're doing or be able to find be able to find help quickly enough in what you need help for. So it's not like everyone's sitting there, you know, like for instance, you wanna, you know, you need a tax lawyer or something like that. You're not having to flip through the yellow pages like, oh, is this guy any good or not? Um, whereas like, oh, it just says lawyer, you know, or it just says accountant, you know, does this person do this? No, that person does cost accounting and can't help you prepare your taxes. Um, there's such easy access to information now um, that I would tell people to tread lightly and take the time to look it up. You'll have people that, you know, wouldn't go to a, a car dealership without researching it. And it's like, hey, what do you got in a sedan? You know, very few people would do that. But then people will make large business decisions without doing the research that they would do before they would buy a used car. So mm -hmm. tread lightly, have a will, and pay your taxes. That would be my advice. And do the you. right thing. You know, that's worked for me for 40 years. You know, I've, I've bored you in business because we don't get in trouble. Right. Because we know the difference between right and wrong, and we try right. to do the right thing. Yeah. And, and if you feel like pushing limits, I mean, to be sure, you know, there's no, thank you. a lot of, a, a, you can do that. And people are like, well, it's easier to make money at the bleeding edge, but you're betting against the house. Well, you know, they, they, I learned in economics, they say, you know, there's, there's certainly no such thing as a free lunch. Maybe there was a free breakfast. Maybe it's hard to tell. You'd have to get there early, but whatever was there, it's gone by lunch. And so if you look at something and it seems too good to be true, or, oh my gosh, we can just make money by doing this. If it were really that easy, people already would have done it and the space would be crowded. That's why you see so many mattress stores. I see. So. And then what about establishing a relationship? You know, we, we've got you in reserve in case, you know, the barbarian, you know, barbarians attack us, but uh, does everybody need to, uh, take their lawyer to the racetrack or, but you at least need to establish a relationship. That's my point. Yeah. So like, um, years ago I read that doctors really hate it when the first time they see a patient is when they're really sick. Right. Cause they're like, I don't know what's normal for you. And so it is a good idea to have a relationship. Um, right now my, my professional, you know, a lot of people leave my profession. And, um, if someone calls me, I, I'm not going to take their call. Um, now, if they're referred uh, by someone I know or something like that. So when the time comes, you know, and people like, oh, I have no relationship or I don't know anyone, um, you know, that, that can be a problem. Um, so, you know, it's good to have a relationship, get an advisor and also test drive someone. Yeah. So in anything that's very difficult to do, it's very difficult for the like. So, for instance, a neurosurgeon, my you know, my wife had a neurosurgeon. I don't really actually know whether or not he's any good. Um, because I don't have the ability to develop or to assess his skills. Um, and so knowing that it's good to kind of, okay, well, I've seen if, if you did this, if you did something this big wrong, you're probably not going to do something this big, right? And so by doing that, you get, you know, you get a chance to kind of, okay, you know, figure out and then have that relationship. And then the person knows you. I mean, everyone's risk profile is different. You're entrepreneurial. And for entrepreneurials, they have entrepreneurs tend to have a very high risk tolerance. And if someone walks in for the first time and you don't know them and you as the professional and you don't know their risk tolerance, you have to go through all of the steps. Whereas, you know, if, if I know you, it's like, okay, I know that you are, you know, clean as a whistle. You drive, you probably drove three miles below the speed limit on the way here. I know not to present you these options that are a little bit more out there or vice versa. And so it's difficult. And what I went, what I said earlier, you, people don't make their best decisions when their heart rate is up and when they're nervous. And so the person who comes in when, you know, the proverbial mud is hitting the fan, I don't know what they're really like. I'm just seeing you under pressure. I'm seeing you it's under stress. Late. It's difficult. It's not too late, but it's more difficult for me to advise you because I'm not getting a take of what you actually think. And so one, I don't know, do I need to calm you down or is this what you're like? Mm -hmm. So it is good. It's like with everything. It's better to have a relationship. You know, don't wait until your car is dead on the side of the road to find a mechanic that you can trust. Well, I you figured know? you would say that, but I think that's the common thread in all these business secret podcasts is every one of the people that I'm bringing on, I've known for decades right and and i think that's key to the whole thing so thanks yeah. for reinforcing it 
Yeah, no, that that's that's absolutely true. And I do that even, you know, I have my firm, you know, I have people that, you know, I mean, is the person I use for X the best person on earth for X? To be candid, probably not. Um, but I know they're competent for what it is and I know them and I trust them and I know I can go to them. And that's key. When my computer system goes down, because it does. It will. And it will. I know who to call. And it's like, it's like, oh, hey, can I get you guys to come over? They're like, oh, hey, Aaron. And I'm like, yeah, I did it again. again. I don't have to explain what it is. And they're like, quit downloading those cat screensavers. You know, you got to stop doing that. But I did it again. I don't have to explain it to them. They don't have to come in and survey and figure out what my system is, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so, yeah, having that in place and having that, it's a type of passive support network. Indeed. And people forget about that. So. It helps me sleep at night. Yeah. yeah. I appreciate yeah. all the help over all these years. Thank you for coming on the show today. Glad to help. So Aaron, you keep calling me an entrepreneur, but uh, not too long ago, I'd say right at a year ago, you, you kind of got the entrepreneurial bug yourself. Yeah, I did. Um, so um, I, you know, as I said earlier, you know, I, I try to play well with others. Just doesn't work. No, it, it, it works, but ultimately I want to have the final say. So um, there's a difference between playing well with others and taking orders from others. So um, uh, a year ago, I left, um, I left my firm and started a firm with my law partner. It's uh, Lloyd and Lorkowski, located here in Houston. Do you have a website? How do they get a hold of you? Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's easiest to find uh, my, uh, my law partner's name. Last name is Lorkowski, which, I mean, I know how to spell. But uh, <laughs> it's not helping. You love that. Um, no, if you just uh, search for Lloyd and Lorkowski, we are the only Lloyd and Lorkowski. It's not oh, like good. Dove Chocolates and Dove Soap. Um, so, yeah, we're Lloyd and Lorkowski. You can find us on the Internet. We have a website and um, happy to help. And here you are one year into it. I've heard you're, you've, you just signed a new lease. You're growing. You're hire, hiring lawyers. Yeah, yeah, we're uh, we're growing. We kind of got our feet underneath us um, as you know, there's there's an art to everything. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's actually been a lot of fun. You know, people say once you work for yourself, you can never go back to working for someone else. We're ruined. Uh, ruined may be the wrong word, um, but I also, have a, I also have a partner, so I'm still kind of working for somebody. Uh, but it's the best kind of partnership, and it's the partnership that, you know, different skills and abilities and, you know, make each other stronger. But, um, yeah, we largely serve um, uh, businesses and um and individuals in houston texas doing um you know death and taxes and the transactions that go along with both um yeah all right so y'all have room for more clients um we do uh yeah happy to help people in any way that we can um you know we, do, we don't do much in the way of litigation outside you know probate or tax court but you know um, people yeah definitely know people and um you know I'm always up for the challenge of helping someone with a problem. That part I really enjoy, and um, I really like beating expectations. Well, you, you've been for, you've been there for us for the last twenty some odd years, so uh, uh, I recommend you. Well, I really appreciate you coming on today. Uh, thanks for coming on. I hope we can get you back here. on again later, and uh, wish the best of luck on your 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 venture. You're one year into it; it seems to be working. I'd be happy to come back on, and thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron. All right.